Good evening, respected teachers and colleagues. Today, the topic for my presentation is for wheel sparing ILM relaxation in myopic traction maculopathy. The moderator for today's presentation is Dr. Pradeep. Coming to what is myopic traction maculopathy. It is mainly seen in th approximately 30% of the eyes with pathological myopia with and without posterior staphyloma. In pathological myopia, the ectasia in the sclera and the retina is not similar. And this differential stretching of the retina is primarily responsible for causing myopic MDM. Uh, Parolini et al. has defined it as a progressive disease that involves the innermost la layers of the retina with an inner macular schisis and gradually progresses involving the outermost retinal layers until a macular detachment occurs, whereas the schisis disappears. It has been described as a, as a push and pull game uh, between the uh, vitreous and the sclera. Uh, the push and pull game basically modifies the ret uh, retina and leads into the macula to different clinical pictures such as schisis, detachments and holes. As we all know, retina is a multicellular, multilayered structure which is held together by centripetal tangential forces exerted mainly by the Muller cells as well as external and internal limiting membranes. In pathological myopia, different centrifugal forces tend to modify the shape and the location of the retina and the fovea from the natural one. Uh, Coming to the centrifugal forces, there are two types of centrifugal forces explained. The first one is perpendicular to the plane of the macula. It causes anterior posterior pulling effect onto the retina, which will lead to uh, which can lead to inner schisis and which can progress uh, to involve the outer layers, becoming an inner outer schisis, a pure outer schisis, uh, and eventually a macular detachment can occur. Coming to the other other type of centrifugal force, which is the tangent, which is basically tangential to the macular plane, which which causes the fovea to be laterally stretched and which can lead to inner lamellar macular holes, and which can progress to form a full thickness macular hole. If both these uh, centrifugal forces act together, the a macular detachment can accompany either either a lamellar macular hole or a full thickness macular hole. Once the macula is detached, tangential forces may also influence the outer layers and a disruption and splitting of the ellipsoid band might occur, generating an outer lamella hole. And the presence of an outer lamella hole uh, is suggestive of a uh, poor visual outcome after surgery. This is the MTM staging system described by Parolini et al, which uh, highlights the evolving dynamic nature of the disease. As you can all see, the tangential evolution of the disease has been explained as A, B, and C subpart. The A has a normal foveal contour. The B, B, uh, B subtype has a, a, a lamellar macular hole. And the, the C component has a full thickness macular hole. Coming, coming to the perpendicular evolution, you can see a inner outer, inner or inner outer macular schisis, predominantly outer macular schisis. Uh, macular schisis and detachment and a macular detachment. As we can all see, as soon as the macular detachment occurs, the schisis will disappear. The This O represents the presence of an outer, uh, outer lamella hole. Uh, coming to the management of uh, myopic tractional maculopathy, in literature, three, mo uh, three most important uh, indications that require surgical interventions that have been described are Full thickness macular macular hole with or without macular detachment, macular fovea schisis with macular detachment, lamella hole with macular detachment. Basically, the uh, the treatment primarily depends on the etiology responsible. So, what are the three vector forces acting at the macula? The first one, tang if it is a tangential traction on the inner retinal surface, that can that can be caused by an abnormal rigid ILM or stretch retinal vessels or an epiretinal membrane. It can, it can either be anteroposterior traction of the vitreous and posterior scleral ectasia. The inflexibility of the ILM is considered an important contributing factor to the development of myopic macular holes. It is postulated that 
the highly in uh, the relatively inelastic ilm resists the anterior posterior traction exerted by the higher axial lens or posterior staphyloma and if it is present in a highly myopic eye a, mac a macular hole retinoschisis or li and later a retinal detachment may occur in such eyes so why ilm peeling ilm peeling will ensure complete removal of the residual uh, vitreous cortex and cellular components on the surface of the macular region. The poor elasticity of the ILM may be responsible for the inability of the retina to conform to the posterior staphyloma. And the ILM can act as a scaffold for cellular prolifer uh, proliferation after vitrectomy, which may cause the tangential traction to the surface of the macula and result in recurrences of the maculopathy. Hence, ILM peeling may not only lead to resolution of the retinous crisis, but is, it, is an, it is also an effective surgery in preventing recurrence. The anterior posterior traction by, uh, caused by the vitreous is addressed by conventional vitrectomy. The tangential forces is negated by the peeling of ILM. Complete PVD is ensured from the disc and the macula. And if ERM is present, the removal of ERM is done. The staphyloma component should be minimal or shallow to go for vitrectomy alone without the need for buccal support. Why, why are we talking about foveal sparing ILM peeling? It has been described that ILM peeling increases the risk of inducing an iatrogenic uh, full thickness macular holes in cases of macular detachments in the, which were previously not present in stage 3 and stage 4a. Therefore, it was suggested to avoid peeling the ILM when a hole was not present. Studies have shown that vitrectomy with foveal sparing, uh, vitrectomy with uh, foveal sparing ILM peeling to treat myopic tractional maculopathy report report an improvement of BCVA and an, uh, and an anatomical resolution of the macular schisis. This is a this is one of the uh, this is a technique uh, described by Zeng et al. This is known as arc shape technique, arc shape fold back technique. In this, the ILM is torn away from the fovea at the temporal side. The outer side, the outer side, which is marked by the arrow, it is grasped by an ILM peeling forceps and moved from the outside to the paracentral fovea. This maneuver is uh, repeated multiple times till a thin, till a thin film of ILM is left behind, which is which is removed with the help of a cutter, and then the eventual eventual result is the epifoveal uh, remnant ILM with the surrounding of ILM peeled area. Though we have to ensure that uh, a complete PVD has been done before proceeding towards uh, ILM peeling, this uh, this study ensured complete uh, PVD induction with, uh, with IVTA, and the staining was done using 0.5 percent endocyanin green. Uh, one more technique has been described by Tian et al. It is known as parafoveal curvilinear internal internal limiting membrane peeling. In this, they have described mainly continuous curvilinear, uh, continuous curvilinear peeling techniques uh, centered away from the fovea in each quadrant that is inferior, superior, nasal, and temporal to the fovea. And approximately 500 microns of ILM epifoveal ILM is left behind. Any inter intervening any intervening ILM between the two uh, between circles were removed with the help of uh, ILM peeling forceps. So, what are the complications of uh, ILM peeling? Dye related toxicity, focal retinal hemorrhages, damage to the molar cells, paracentral retinal holes, paracentral microscotomas, and dissociated optic nerve fiber layer. Coming to the uh, studies comparing uh, foveal sparing ILM peeling with complete traditional ILM peeling. So, this is one of the studies done by Shimada et al. Uh, they compared 30 eyes with complete macular uh, macular ILM peeled group, and uh, 15 of the 15 eyes were in the foveal sparing ILM peeling group. It was noted that the BCVA was significantly better in the uh, in the foveal sparing group, and the full thickness macular hole was noted in 16.7 percent of the completely ILM peeled group, and none of them were present in the foveal spared uh, ILM peeled group. Another study described by Shiraki et al. This was a re retrospective case series um, in which these cases were at least followed up for 12 months. In the foveal sparing uh, group, 26 eyes were recruited 
and in the st standard uh, complete ILM peeling group, uh, 76 eyes were recruited. The visual and anatomical improvements were comparable, uh, but with uh, foveal sparing ILM pe peeling showed the ability to prevent post-operative macular hole formation and a consequent imp impairment in vision. This is one more study de uh, described by Tian et al. Uh, in this, they recruited 18 patients in the foveal sparing ILM group and 18 patients in the total ILM peeling group. A uh, full thickness macular hole developed in 5.6% of the foveal spared group, whereas 16.7% was the incidence in the total, uh, total uh, complete ILM peeling group. Long-term follow-up showed uh, better visual improvement in the foveal sparing group, and macular schizes disappeared in 72.2% uh, in the foveal sparing group. Thus, they concluded that foveal sparing ILM achieves a higher rate of macular schizes over total peeling group. Uh, post -operate, they also concluded that a, a pre-operative uh, pre -operative outer lamellar hole can be a risk factor for the development of a macular hole. Uh, coming to the discussion of cases uh, that we have done here, a 63-year-old uh, lady uh, presented to us with diminution of vision for a year. Her best corrected visual acuity in the right eye was 636 and in the left eye was 636. Uh, she was diagnosed elsewhere as a right eye retinoschisis and given a single dose of anti vagi and left eye diagnosed as myopic CNVM and given two doses of anti vagi this is the fundus picture of the right eye. We'll be discussing each eye separately at, as we have operated both eyes. So this is the fundus photo of the right eye. You can see the posterior staphyloma with dense uh, choroidal atrophy in the macular region and schizes involving the fovea. A B scan was done. A subtle, uh, subtle excavation was noted uh, that is suggestive of a posterior staphyloma. Uh, a highly reflective membrane from the optic nerve head towards the macula was noted, which was suggestive of a macular detachment. OCT was done for, uh, for the eye. There's foveal detachment, outer nuclear schizes, and, temp and you can see temporal nerve fiber layer schizes as well. So we did a vitrectomy with a, uh, we did a complete vitrectomy, uh, ensured complete PVD using IVTA. And then after staining with 0.05% uh, of brilliant blue, uh, brilliant blue BBG, uh, we performed a uh, ILM uh, foveal sparing ILM peeling. This is the post-operative uh, post-operative uh, glass appointment OCT scan that was taken. We can still see the presence of a macular schizes, uh, macular detachment with the thickened photoreceptor layers. As we had followed up the patient for the other eye. At six months, we can we can see that the the foveal de detachment has disappeared, but there's loss of ellipsoid uh, ellipsoid band, and some perifoveal schizes is still left with some minimal SRF. The best corrected visual acuity at uh, glass appointment was 618, and it improved to 615 after six months. Coming to the left eye, this is a picture of the left eye showing posterior staphyloma with subretinal fluid. Similar picture of hyperreflective membrane extending, extending from the optic nerve head to, towards the macula, suggestive of macular detachment. OCT was done, OCT was done, uh, OCT was done, and the OCT reveals a big macular detachment. Similarly, we did a ILM uh, vitrectomy with ILM peeling. We in both the cases, we used air as a tamponade. We, we did FG and we left air behind. We can see that the macula, the macula is attached and the schizes is more or less disappeared. And the best corrected visual acuity is 615 at glass appointment. This is one of the videos from uh, one of the surgeries. PVT induction was, was done. IVTA was used. Mm -hmm. IVTA was used to stain the residual cortex. We did an active uh, aspiration of the uh, loose IVTA crystals with cutter to ensure uh, removal of the hyaloid. A soft cannula tip is used to remove the loose crystals and to identify the areas of adherent cortical sheath stained by the IVTA. We can notice that even after using the dye and staining it for two minutes, 
the contrast is very poor. The FG. No, I don't use FG. I don't use FG for uh, brilliant blue. I just keep staining it m more times if I have to stain well. So this is basically describing my uh, video only. So we use 23 gauge. Please don't use 25 gauges for uh, myopic uh, myopic SSDs. So 25, 23 gauge uh, cutter is around uh, and light pipe. Both are long enough. And if you use it at a horizontal meridian, 3.5 mm or maybe even four in the temporal quadrant, you'll be able to get, uh, you'll reach the macula because it's a 31 millimeter size, the uh, the length of that uh, cutter. So you'll be able to reach the disc at least. But if you use a 25 gauge, you get only 28 millimeters. So you lose that extra length that you have. And the more horizontal you go, the greater ch uh, chance of you able to reach the uh, macula. It is a disc at least. If it is a, 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 if you a right eye, uh, then it will be, uh, I mean, you can intuse with the left eye, the optic nerve. If it is a left eye, uh, you can use it with your, you can use uh, reach the disc with the right eye. So that is the uh, thing that you should look for. That's why I wanted to show that first picture of 23, the orange colored, uh, th uh, what do you call it? The cannulas. And again, in this case, you can see that the choroid is uh, hardly any pigmentation is there. And you still, with, even after using the brilliant blue dye, you're not able to see it. We have stained it two, three times, and still it is not very clear to, uh, to the naked eye, despite uh, using the brilliant blue stain. So, and then you can't, you, and you, for fear of uh, pinching the whole retina, and you know the retina is thin, sometimes you struggle to pinch the eye limb. So do it looks very comical. If you like actually look at the video, it looks very comical. Your uh, attempts at trying to pinch the island two, three times, you'll reach there, you'll try to pull something, it'll not come. So you're actually looking at how the retina behaves when you actually pinch it. So that's what is going to happen. So two, three times it'll be, this is a very condensed video. But it took me at least 15, 20 minutes to actually pinch a reasonable amount of ILM and do it. So it takes a long time. So this is not like a routine macular over surgeries. Go ahead. <laughs> like sir said, multiple pinching efforts were made. You see that the whole retina starts moving. And this is not the one which had the macular detachment. This is the right eye which had a less uh, macular detachment. Only a shysis. Finally, you get some peel and you start peeling. And again, you hardly see where's the fovea. So you have to assume where the vessels end is the fovea or vessels in that region. So you have to avoid that area. And these remnant uh, cortical sheets with the IV, uh, IVTA stuck to it have to be removed. And that's why you, you can reuse IVTA multiple times to keep seeing those areas. It has to be absolutely a clean macula without any of these sheets. So again, these are areas where there are, if you see, you know, finally, again, you will not be able to see anything. It's very difficult to actually make out the IIT. Only when you pinch something and you start pulling, you will realize that the retina is getting pulled. So something is getting removed. So here like this, this, there's something getting removed here. So you see the transmission of your forces on the retinal surface when you see the retina getting pulled. There again, this very faintly stained ILM. And then you have these, you can see this along the vessels, you see these dark areas. Those are the inner lamellar holes. So sometimes in those areas, the island is also not uh, very easily removable, actually. So you try your best to remove as much as island possible around the, the central fovea. So we are going far beyond the uh, thing. This is another case where we have a detached. This is not connected to those two cases that you have shown. But here, the macula is totally detached within the staphyloma area. So you are staining with the IVT and you now since the cutter was not, uh, what do you call, doing a good job, so I had to actually start physically removing with the forceps. So you can see that the traction is transmitted to the macula when you pull. So you have to be very gentle. You can't just simply pull it straight in the anteroposterior direction. So it's mostly circumferential traction. And then you, because of the sharing force of the circumferential uh, movement of your uh, uh, forceps, you are able to transmit the forces along the surface of the retina, not causing a break. 
So that allowed us to remove the hyaloid completely. Then we stained the macula. And just to show how the retina behaves, the detached retina, myopic retina, how it behaves. So you can actually see the shear on the retinal surface. You can see that white tissue at the base of the ILM just peel. So you have to be extremely careful, slowly, patiently remove it. It will come piecemeal. It is not like, and then now what I'm trying to show is a centripetal action. The, the ILM is pulled towards the fovea, not the way he was trying to describe that Chinese uh, author, the multiple. Uh, yeah, so this is just, tried, I don't have a better video to show, but this is the best we could do to show the foveal sparing ILM peeling. So this was the case that uh, he showed also. He also showed the same thing in his presentation. And this is the case. So a series of the photographs clearly show how the pigmentation, the choroid is. You can actually not see. In this case, there was not a macular detachment. It was just an outer lamellar hole. You can see with the foveal detachment. Outer lamellar hole is not there, I'm sorry. The foveal is, is detached with the schisis in the outer nuclear, inner nuclear, and in the nerve fiber layer. So with the wide ILM peeling, sparing the fovea, we could get a, a reasonable uh, outcome. But not all cases are as good as what we are showing. This is just to show a successful case. Not necessarily that all cases will go like this. These are my just one, go back to the, the, the case. Uh, yeah, one minute. Just one minute. Yeah, back. Uh, next one. Forward, forward. 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 Next. Yeah, when the Okay, uh, can the uh, surface uh, myopic uh, maculopathy when it comes to your OPD, uh, you ask for the investigations. So what particular investigations you would like to ask for, to look for what you need to, as he has described that there are some features which you need to look into the, the retinal configuration or the macular area. So, What's the clinching uh, thing investigation which you look for? Yeah, can be preferred over the normal SDOCT because of its uh, uh, depth imaging. Uh, you need to look at the length of the, the macula, the overall, uh, the tractional, whatever he's talking about, the tangential, the vertical. So to get an idea of how much the pull is there, so a long uh, length, uh, nine uh, up to 12 millimeters can, SSOCT is preferred. And uh, any other investigation? Ultrasound. Yeah, is that ultrasound enough for you to describe? Is it a correct ultrasound? Okay, so if you just ask for ultrasound and review the person, you are there. You just do this and then send. Does it get any information to the surgeon? Yes, Why ultrasound was asked for? Uh, so to look for uh, axial length, uh, comparison of axial length and uh, for the extent of the staphyloma. Okay. And the staphyloma, you can try to get at least the axial length, including the staphyloma. And the depth of the staphyloma, if you can really keenly measure, you can you can do so. And uh, what is its uh, uh, exact location in comparison to the optic nerve? Like, that will give us an indirect uh, way of Curtin's classification of posterior staphyloma. I'll go back next to OCT. Yeah, second, uh, the down, the lower one, you have all the very classical features, what he's talking about. Okay, the, what's that, the, the top surface of the layer which is separating from the other layer, what is that? This side, this side, yeah, there also, if you see the islands of the separation, that's the ILM. Okay, ILM, you can see and uh, get an idea like how much it has already separated, that will give you an information. Uh, during the surgery, where you can just start getting the cleavage. And uh, can anyone describe uh, that what we talk about inner skysis and outer skysis? Can you show? Especially the lower one has got all the classical features. This is the nerve, nerve fiber layer schisis, and then this is the inner nuclear schisis. Where does the skysis differentiate? Inner and outer skysis? Which layer? You only have to tell. Photoreceptor layer. Loud. Photoreceptor. Yes. Anybody to differ? In this OCT, does it look there is a there's a concavity or the of the 
retina go to the next OCT again here maybe the, the is expanded the OCT otherwise you will get a good concavity of the retinal this the skysis gets relieved once the retina goes back can uh, one of you sum up like where do you need the surgical intervention in this myopic maculopathy is the patient symptomatic if that uh, nine chart of uh, paralene is given to you so if you happen to do the OCT you will come across one of the features at least okay and uh, which is the case, uh, which are the cases which requires a surgical intervention, which are the cases which can be observed and followed up. You can see all the red lines, it's already mentioned it. At least interpret that red color, whatever it has been there. Uh, she doesn't want us to see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Everything is written there, see. What exactly matters for the patient's vision? We drop in the vision happens what on the retina, on the OCT, what you see to correlate that the patient Patient says that I had about one month of drop in the vision, in my near, near vision. I was able to read. I'm not able to read now. Can't hear you. If there is any uh, formation of macular or hole, full thickness macular hole is noted, or if there is detachment noted at the uh, fovea, is this fovea? Uh, fovea, uh, fovea okay. Right? So what I mean is there is a disruption at the fovea, either in term or there is a neurosensory detachment. There is a separation of the, the RPE from the neurosensory retina. These are the only two reasons when the patient complains about that. So when there is only the skysis, the first few, even the lamellar hole, does the patient do not come across such type of sudden drop in the vision or obvious vision deterioration. Okay? So when, when there is a threat through the fovea, either in terms of detachment, or with a formation of a hole, then we need to start going towards the surgical indication. Okay. So one more important point is to also see the cephaloma. Okay. So if you look through literature and uh, in myopia, you see that cephaloma can be central, or uh, the, I mean, sorry, the fovea can be at the dead center of the concavity of the cephaloma, or it could be at one of the edges of the cephaloma. So this, there's so much variation in that. So these are all classic cases. If you see everything is falling in a one single straight line from top to bottom, the fovea being uh, at the top of the, the concavity at the most concave part of the cephaloma. So it is actually anatomically uh, good, but many a times the cephaloma is at one edge. I mean, the fovea is at one edge of the cephaloma. In those cases, we are not doing this at all. Okay. All the whole uh, chart is showing that the fovea falls exactly at the center of the concavity of the cephaloma, and that's why it is having all these pathologies. But if the fovea sub were supposed to, if you imagine the fovea at one slant, uh, then these uh, then it take then the surgeon has to take a call on that disease, what to do with it. So all this the whole thing, if you see the fovea is dead center of the cephaloma, that is the highest curvature of the cephaloma. So cause that means the highest anterior posterior traction, the highest tangential traction is occurring at the fovea because it's sitting at the center of the cephaloma. If it is at the edge of the cephaloma, then it will have asymmetric uh, uh, tractions. The fo fovea is not at the center, it's at the edge of the cephaloma. So there'll be more tangential traction versus anterior posterior traction. So it will not follow this uh, beautiful chart. So then the surgery has to be decided depending on whether there are fovea de develops a hole, no hole, or there is a sarf at the fovea. So you have to look at the myopia literature to see the interaction between the cephaloma and the retina. So Muna ma'am has raised the hand. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, uh, nice presentation. And uh, uh, just a couple of suggestions while we image high myopic patients. Always remember the staphylomas don't follow a particular pattern. They can be very wide, they can be very deep, and not necessarily is the fovea in the center. So when you ask for an OCT, ask for the Swexos. Since we have the plexally, you ask for the 16 millimeter HD scans, which are very wide and will help you to get the best perspective of your staphyloma. 
to one scan center and the fovea look all 360 degrees to understand the shape of the staphylopa because sometimes what you see horizontally may be very different from what you see vertically so go all the 12 clock hours understand the shape and configuration of the staphylopa look for breaks in every quadrant because breaks need not always be at the fovea breaks can be in relation to the retinal blood vessels also when you finished looking at this with the fovea center then move your centration to the optic disc and again repeat the hd scan of 16 mm if you have plexelite otherwise a regular swept source with the 12 mm scans again do the same thing 360 degree around the optic disc because in myops you can have peripapillary schizes you can have these choroidal cavitations you can have small full thickness retinal breaks in the area of atrophy so spend a lot of time understanding the anatomy of each and every clock hour in these eyes and then you will be able to plan your surgery much better one elegant feature of this mtm classification is that it directly tells you the treatment so if you move from the left to right you have to go more towards vitrectomy but when you go from up to down like when the staphyloma increases then you have to support from a macular buckle actually so the classification itself points to the treatment so when you go both down and to the right you have to combine both of them both buckle and vitrectomy so diagonally you go to macular buckle and and please it is a ultrasound which is more important to define the uh, staphyloma shape you are looking at the shape whether the disc is at the center of the staphyloma or is at the edge of the staphyloma or the staphyloma is asymmetric all that is definitely that's why you have to pay more attention when you are doing the ultrasound we are looking at where is the nerve in relation to the staphyloma the oct is actually a uh, the picture will not tell you the concavity of the staphyloma because it is artificially created when you have a 9 mm scan on the sdoct it artificially tries to fit in the the 9 mm within your uh, your uh, what do you call the 16 by 9 ratio aspect ratio of your uh, what do you call everything is rectangle right of your uh, imaging device i mean your monitors so it artificially compressed so you get an artificial concavity always so that's why madam is saying 16 mm scans will not artificially compress and you might get an idea of the staphyloma structure much better even uh, the ssoct is 12 mm so even that is better than doing the 9 mm scans on any of the other devices you don't want to get an artificially compressed scan which tells so the worst compression happens in the ssoct spectral ssoct it compresses the image so much that you artificially get a uh, staphyloma in many of the diseases remember because you're trying to compress a 9 mm scan into the 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 monitor of your uh, uh, your viewing device mm-hmm. lg sir no, i think it's very well presented and very well to discuss nothing much for me to add mm-hmm. except i just want to ask dr pradeep who has the maximum experience with macular buckles would you do in every case like what you seen in 4a or 4a b directly macular buckle or would you give a chance with first ilm peeling alone and then do buckle if it fails it was again a little learning curve self learning it happened though all these articles were guiding in a general way there is a little deviation what we i mean i i try to see now uh, though the theoretically like uh, parallelly advises that the more the staphyloma you try to support with the buckle one with the buckle related more of the uh, the surgical intricacies or complication i try to more concentrate on the axial length of the eyeball so even up to 30 31 with a very broad staphyloma and uh, a good retinal thickness still we can go with our conventional vitrectomy which serves the most of the cases and uh, only in very few cases like in the this top last so there the staphyloma is really disproportionate to the retinal con- 
configuration. Retinal structure is itself very small. So unless you support it, it will not go back. And those cases, if we try vitrectomy with a large ILM peeling, it can cause a large hole and then uh, recurrence of the surgery. So this is what I have learned. So even that uh, the last uh, buckle, what she is planning, still I try to follow the vitrectomy and uh, reserve the macular buckle, very few cases. The other point I would like to make is that when you decide that on doing any major surgical procedure, we need to see the potential for visual recovery. But these are all eyes with very high myopia, likely that the whole posterior pole is having a lot of RP atrophy. In fact, some of the cases, we don't see even chorea capillaries. It's just a bare sclera that you see in large patches. So if that is involving the macular area, he's not going to get back any useful vision. And there's no meaning in trying to even fix the central foveal detachment. So you need to see what is the visual potential before you operate upon them. Because surgery on these highly myopic eyes is not easy. As, as Dr. Chetan Rao clearly mentioned, it's not easy to even see the ILM. Leave alone peel it and produce a so-called foveal sparing ILM peeling. It's not always easy to achieve that in a given eye. In fact, I have had two eyes after I came back and started operating here where I couldn't even reach the macula easily with the existing instruments. Even the so-called, um, I mean, even the 23 gauge forceps couldn't reach it. I had to actually close one sclerotomy, make another one posteriorly to be able to reach. Even without the trocar canal, I couldn't reach it. So such being the case, uh, ILM staining is also very, very poor in these cases. So you have difficulty. So before you operate, make sure that it is like it is indicated and not do it just because the fovea is showing uh, sky is a detachment in a given myopic eye. Second point you should remember is that if the patient's vision is reasonably good, say 6 by 12, 6 by 15, with a macular sky you would hesitate to operate. The reason is that the sky still indicates that there is communication between the outer retinal layers and inner retinal layers. And those cases may have been actually having a reasonably good vision considering the visual potential of that eye. So you must have a demonstrable drop in vision before you indicate surgery. Presence of obvious cases at first instance did not necessarily indicate need for surgery. Glaucoma mm -hmm. is uh, one of the, the, the narrow changes or the glaucoma is one of the uh, need to take it a serious contraindication for either of the surgery, even for a vitrectomy, because they already will have only the central tubular vision and those patients land up with a macular hole and uh, you without analyzing and uh, just go with the conventional surgery. The surgery goes good, macular hole might close, but still they may have that washout phenomenon and you may lose the complete vision. So glaucoma will be one of the very serious thing to think about before planning any of the surgery. And as Sir told, if there is even a one CNVM or a patchy atrophy or a lacquer cracks, whatever it is under the fovea, those are all come under the poor visual prognosis. So you need not be very heroic in your surgery, advising or uh, going for the surgery. Uh, yeah. uh, very good, nice class always. Thank I you. also agree with uh, LG sir that uh, oftentimes what happens is even after the successful uh, ILM peeling and uh, 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 the retina also becomes flat, the macular detachment is gone, fovea shysis is gone, but there is a paradoxical retinal thinning and that causes a loss of vision. So even after a successful surgery, the patient may not get any useful vision. So it's a little bit very difficult to uh, explain to the patient. So you have to be very careful in choosing the patient and you have to explain the prognosis very clearly to the patient that it may or may not help. And the second thing I wanted to ask you during your literature search, did you come across any uh, case series where they have done only vitrectomy without any ILM peeling for this kind of myopic uh, shysis? Yeah, um, I had given the papers yeah. to you. There is one article, madam, mm -hmm. uh, where initially all these were along the, I think I have noted on 2011 12 articles from Chinese group. Uh, they have done for only the macular detachment, they have done only the vitrectomy and with hypothesizing that uh, the vitreous is the, the major cause for the, the tangential traction. And they have noted that uh, the retina has settled well, but uh, the macular hole formation, secondary formation of a hole is up to 20%, they have mentioned. Then came the series of the with the same authors of ILM peeling, 
and uh, noting the secondary macular hole formation, little lesser, up to at least what he has quoted, 5 to 15 percent. Then came the evolving the, the, the next ILM relaxation or sparing the IOL. So it was like more of a natural history of the surgery. Are the visual results better with a myopic buckle than a vitrectomy? The visual um, results? Not much uh, I could make out, madam. Now, at least uh, we have about eight years follow up also. Few of uh, three, four patients who are coming to us. They have uh, the vision recorded is maintaining, never have improved. And uh, but their uh, contrast and uh, their quality of the the lifestyle or their version is especially the one night patients uh, it's not very rewarding probably as like sir told after the vitrectomy there is a definitely the retinal thinning after the ilm peeling same thing happens when there is a the push of the retina and uh, maybe the cra is increasing it's very difficult to make out whether the chorioretinal patches are increasing in that we don't have any functional uh, assessment to look at these cases did you sir suppose uh, documented fovea crisis increase along with drop in vision. Would you advise surgery or? Yes, yes, you would yes. Advise yeah, only, then you can take only a disguises, but yes. documented progression yes, of yes, yes. See, as long as the vitrectomy with a moderate staphyloma, approachable, uh, surgically, technically approachable things, yes, you can definitely go with our uh, the gadgets. What we have, it's quite safe now. Again, uh, when adding on macular buckle, the problem is a sudden change in a refraction. And sometimes patients just cannot tolerate that. Sometimes even myopia goes into hypermetropic refractive error. So we have to warn the patient uh, sometime uh, before even surgery. We have to counsel them well. That sometimes can be increased distortion because of dome shaped macula. That's a little bit uh, difficult situation. That uh, will be very much amplified and uh, because all these myopes would have had their uh, radial keratotomy, LASIK, and they come to you and uh, they may have a little lens changes and all these matters of your final visual outcome and the macular convexity after the buckle. So the counseling is very important because the person who were emetropic after the LASIK can now has to start uh, adopting for the hypermetropic uh, number which is not so easy for my hopes okay, these are the things which pre-op counseling we need to make it madam uh, mp madam anything is there no no very nice uh, presentation uh, probably i would emphasize a lot on uh, the refraction of the patient before you plan surgery because even if uh, shysis increases if you do a good refraction you find that you are able to correct the patient reasonably well. So before taking a decision to operate on the patient, just get a good refraction done again. And if the patient is seeing better with that change in refraction, just give them a new pair of glasses. Sometimes you are able to postpone surgery for some more time. Uh, always one small comment about your this thing, pictures, no? Photos and OCTs when you are putting up, don't drag them. And when you are showing comparison, let them be of the same size actually. Okay. You put pictures which are of different sizes for comparison, OCT of different sizes and lens for comparison. They look very odd. So when you do that, no, just in your in your PowerPoint on the picture format, you can just keep the lock the aspect ratio, and then you increase the size. It will not uh, get distorted. Just lock the aspect ratio there, so it it will retain the aspect of uh, the image that you have. Just lock it. Otherwise, what happens? You don't lock it, and it goes either horizontally or vertically. It increases in size. I think if anybody has any more comments or discussion points, this will be the last comment from Dr. D.A.D. So uh, you all know that we are going to have a Retina Summit conference on 30th uh, June and 1st of July. And this is what we are going to discuss in the conference. So all of you must attend the conference and also ask your friends to register for the conference and come for the conference. Okay. And you all will be involved. Some responsibility, something maybe uh, will need help from all of you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you.